All right, so uh, I'm Andy Rudolph. I work at Intel, and uh, I've been concentrating on persistent memory, and I have like 100 slides, and this is a dialogue, so uh, um, I boiled it down to, I think, three or four max. And so, because I, I just wanted to sort of frame the discussion and then just open it up, right? So I am not here to show you a whole mess of slides. But can you point at slides? But I can. I can point you at lots of slide decks, because I've been Doing, I've been doing the rounds. I did a, a long presentation at the Storage Developers Conference just earlier this week. So um, this slide is one that I stole from somebody, so don't ask me to explain the technology. Even though I'm from Intel, I'm not, I'm not here to announce any sort of product. I'm just here to, this is the it's coming slide. There are all these um, next generation non-volatile memory technologies coming. I listed a few of them here. Um, there are more. You can Google for them. And really, the whole point of this slide is that bottom purple box there that says, you know, now we're, we're going uh, uh, to see something that we don't see a lot in our careers. Uh, we're going to see a 1,000x improvement in, in the uh, um, speed of, uh, of non-volatile memory. And uh, it's going to be a lot closer to DRAM speeds than it is to storage speeds like it is now. So. Um, you know, trust me, there's a pretty picture and a lot of words, so it's coming. Um, the, other, the other point is that some of it's here already, and, and uh, I have slides that I didn't bother to put here, um, but I was at the Flash Memory Summit just, a, you know, a month or so ago, and there are a lot of vendors there, and some of them are in the room, who, who make NVDIMMs, so already we're getting these, this byte addressable persistence already. Um, this slide is a, lot, is a lot more interesting, I think. Um, what I tried to do here is stack up the, you know, where does the latency go when you're accessing non-volatile memories today? So you can see, you know, on the top one, that's NAND. That's a SATA 3 NAND drive. ONFI 2 is the, is the interface for talking to the NAND chips. And you can see uh, the, the lion's share of that latency is spent in, in the NAND. The NAND is as fast as it is, right? It's, it's the, it takes the, the most amount of time. You can see uh, we've put on other things for transferring f um, over uh, buses and other MISC things, but the, the thing I kind of wanted to point out was this software component. So this is basically everything from the time that the data leaves the hardware until it gets up through the software stack, right? And the software here is just kind of a puny little portion of this overall time, so why worry about it? You know, we, the software stack gets tweaked and, and performance improves over time, but you know, we could improve the performance of the software quite a bit there. It wouldn't make much of a big difference. Uh, you can see when in the move from ONFI 2 to ONFI 3, this uh, kind of bluish, dark bluish area cut, cut in half. That helped a lot. And then, you know, NVM Express um, makes a big difference here. That's what this third line here is. So in NVM Express, you can see the, the NVM is, is uh, speeding up quite a bit. Um, and what really improved was this green portion. Instead of going over uh, SATA, you're going over PCIe. And then this stuff that's coming, this, it's coming, looming out there in the future, uh, really changes everything, right? This is just so dramatically different that I, I, I just love the way it shows up on this slide is, you know, here, 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 and it's the thing that's coming. And so now look at the portion of the latency that's due to software, right? Now software is like 50% of the latency. Now it's more interesting to do something about that, right? It, it, it's, uh, it, we're going to find ourselves with uh, uh, latency-sensitive applications, people who really want to leverage this, this next-generation NVM, and we want to make it as directly accessible to these applications as possible. So uh, it would be great if we can address some of that, that software overhead, which is now going to be closer to half of the latency. Yeah. Is that, is that pretty steady across different like, web sizes or devices? Is that or again, reminder, please grab the mic so I'm recording oh. the uh, Is this are these overhead measurements reasonably consistent with other request types? Is this representative or you know are writes a lot worse, you know, large requests? Uh, I'm gonna give better? you everybody's favorite answer to that. It depends. Right, and, and so uh, uh, about what I can tell you is that if you go and Google some of these technologies, there are definitely some of them coming where writes are slower than reads. Um, there are definitely some of them where they're, 
at the same basic performance. So. Yeah, no, I don't care about the underlying technology. I care yeah. about the relative of the red versus the, the other colors. Uh, so Is do you mean the software ever worse than 50% of the problem? Um, yes, but not, uh, but, but not directly to, to the point I'm trying to make. In other words, the, 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 the software stack looks a lot different if you say, hey, this stuff is uh, direct attached to my computer. It's a single point of failure. I can't store data on it if it's a single point of failure, so I have to have a remote replication. And everything changes, right? Because now the, the long pole in the tent becomes the amount of time it takes to do a remote replication. So I guess what I'm really saying is this, this is just a direct software stack that I'm kind of showing here. I don't think it changes much based on workload until you start adding these other interposing drivers that people add to storage, like for replication or RAID. And then it gets big again. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, there's a whole bunch of companies that got together uh, to try and talk about um, how this this change, this looming change, uh, should change the way that we program to, to NVM. Uh, it's called the NVM Programming TWIG. TWIG stands for Technical Work Group. Uh, there are like 40 companies in it, and uh, Red Hat is one of them. And, I, and I, uh, I really set out to do one thing. I set out to get one kind of point across with the, getting all these companies together. It wasn't that we were going to come up with the world's greatest API for NVM or anything like that. I really just wanted to get a, like a few ideas together. And the, the, the main thing, since I'm really big on persistent memory, the main thing is that you can open up blobs of persistent memory, map them into your address space, and do loads and stores on them directly. And that's, that's all I'm really headed for. And we seem to have gotten pretty good traction on that with and, these. And Andy, just, yeah. just to point out, I mean, everybody who hears this talk for the first time gets confused between NVMe which is just a kind of Thank a next you. generation of the current technology driver, which is really it's a great improvement for, for existing Flash, and NVM. There's an unfortunate name collision. There is. Yeah. Now, this is, in, this, what, this is the only place where NVME is referred to anywhere on my slides. This is NVM Express. It's a PCIe-connected SSD. This is NVM, non-volatile memory, connected somehow to the machine. It could be that it's connected through PCI. It could be that it's plugged into a DIMM slot. And we're starting to see uh, the emergence of these non-volatile DIMMs, NV DIMMs. And I think the DIMM slot is the particularly interesting part. Well, it, but it might not be. The, 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 the comment was this was easier when we were allowed to call it PCM. But it might not be PCM. There's a, there are definitely competing technologies coming out. Yeah, that was on the previous slide. So I wanted to yeah. ask you about um, the software component in yeah. that final uh, future NVM. How did you derive that? Uh, it was measured. Uh, I'm trying to remember who did the measurements, but uh, I think it was measured by uh, Annie Fong in, uh, in the storage technology group at Intel using a, a, a recent Linux stack. Yeah, so, so just assume you, you drive a whole file system, normal transaction through the block layer, through SCSI or something, all the way down to where you are today. So they actually have this hardware, and then they have actually measured this. OK, it's so the, 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 there's two different questions there. Remember, I'm the software guy. They don't let me announce anything about hardware. But how this was measured was inside of Intel, and, and a few of you we've mailed these things to, we've got a, we have a card that you put DRAM on and that you program it with the timings of different technologies. So whether the hardware actually exists or not, is not important because you're really just taking something and emulating different types of NVM. You plug it in, and then you can measure how the, how the software stack behaves yeah, but, with but it. But to your earlier point, there are actually shipping parts today that you can buy that are basically non-volatile DIMMs that right. you, can, you can test this on. Right? Okay. You, you don't get the persistence without a motherboard I, that. I meant to bring one. I actually yeah. forgot. Uh, I, have, I, I ordered some NV DIMMs. They're sitting on, on somebody's desk back at work. I meant to bring one just to show you because it's kind of a cool thing to look at. I did bring a picture, but I pruned it out when I made the slides small. But it's a, it's a dim, and you plug it in, and then there's this cable that you plug into it, and, and it has a, a little a, a board with big capacitors on it that you're supposed to Velcro to the side of the cabinet to keep it from rattling around. And, that's, and, and that's a, it's a kind of a cool technology. It sounds kind of wonky, but it's cool in that it's DRAM speeds, right? It's just DRAM. 
but it knows when the power fails and it uses the energy in those capacitors to squirrel everything away to NAND. And so you don't worry about NAND wear out because the NAND only gets used on power failures. How often does that happen? And uh, on the power restore, it pulls it back in. Um, it's obviously more expensive than DRAM because it's DRAM plus a bunch of other logic. So, you know, I think that's something that we're going to see change over the next few years is that the NVM will be a more appropriately priced like DRAM. And it's also smaller capacity than DRAM because they have all that other logic there. So the, the one I have is a 8 gig per DIM right now. But I think the capacities are, are going to also uh, be much more similar to, to DRAM capacities. Yeah, and, and I would encourage people, I mean, if you are interested in this, you don't need to buy these exotic parts. Just wave a magic wand over a box with a few extra gigabytes of DRAM and use that as a virtual, you know, an emulated block device. Just don't test power fail safeness. <laughs> right? I mean, so you can test this with real DRAM today if you stick DRAM underneath your, your stack and see how fast it is. Right? So, so I've been using the term persistent memory because there are all these different technologies. And, and it, I think it's important for me to tell you what I mean when I say persistent memory. It's load store accessible and you would reasonably stall the CPU waiting for a load. Okay, you wouldn't reschedule the process and then go do a page fault and then schedule it back. The, the, my definition of, of persistent memory is that the, the persistent memory is fast enough that it's reasonable to just say, stall the CPU. You know, maybe it's DRAM speeds, maybe it's not quite DRAM speeds, but it's still fast enough that you don't feel like you have to context switch away. In fact, context switching away would be a, a total loss, right? Because it'd take you so long to context switch away, the I.O. would be long done by the time you could do that. Yeah. So could you please explain to us why you need a stop, uh, software stack in front of something which basically plugs it into a dim socket? This is like the perfect straight man question. <laughs> you don't. You don't. Um, but uh, again, it's in a slide that I pruned out. I probably should have brought the whole deck. Um, I guess I could switch. Um, yeah, the, so the question is, okay, this stuff plugs into a DIMM slot. Why do you need software at all in front of it? And, and this, is, this is exactly the perfect straight man question because what I'm here to talk about is how to get software out of the way, right? So uh, today, if you want volatile memory in a program, uh, a C program, you call malloc, you get back this blob of, of volatile memory. Everybody, it's a well-worn interface. I, I, I swear I think malloc's been around as long as C or close to it, right? So everybody understands it. So why don't we just have a PM malloc? And you just call PM malloc, and then you have direct load store access to the memory. And, and, and that is kind of where I'm headed, except for it's persistent. You're going to want to get back to it later, right? The program exits or the machine crashes. You come back up. You're going to want to get back to the persistence that you stored. So it needs a name. That, and that's all I'm here to tell you, is that it needs a name, really. And once you, once you cross into that, well, gosh, it needs a name, you know, you start thinking about, well, what should the namespace look like? Should we have little IDs or object IDs or, I, I hate that term, but, you know, things like this. And, you know, my background's in file systems, so of course it needs a file name, right? That's just, that's the, the Unix-y way of handling things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> also, also it's persistent, so you're going to want to do things like RAID over it, otherwise you're oh. going to risk losing some of your data. Another perfect straight man point, yeah. You're going to want to do RAID over it, and, and also just normal management of it, right? I mean, you, you, you run a program, it allocates, you know, 500 gigs of persistent memory, and you say, boy, that program sucks, and you uninstall it. You're going to want to free that somehow. Right? You're going to want to type RM and get rid of that persistent memory. And, and I, I always also want to point out that if you change the way programs, applications talk to stuff that persists their data, it'll take like 100 years for people to change their application stack. So, so I'd say that there's kind of three stages, right? There's we have to make the existing stack run really fast. That's just the boring nuts and bolts. Get as much of that software out of there using the whole stack we have today. Second thing is fix file systems or access methods to get out of the way. So Andy, you'll, we'll talk more about some ideas there. The third is, you know, whatever really exotic stuff, right? Applications that'll do that last tenth of a percent of, of performance to and program to weird object APIs or whatever, or just 
map it in and, and do that. But most application developers don't change very rapidly. How many apps are multi-threaded after like 100 years of SMP? <laughs> or correctly multi-threaded. Correctly multi-threaded? That's even fewer. So. And, 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 and like, mm, oh, yeah, what's the word? Memory map it. Yeah, yeah, if, if only. If only. Is, is, okay, so, so this, is, this is the question. For 30 years, you've been able to memory map files on, on Unix-like systems and actually most other OSs. So what's different? What am I asking for that's different? Well, today, if you open up a, a file and you mmap it, you're really mmapping the page cache, right? In other words, as you do loads and stores, that stuff faults in and out of the page cache. So I'll just, you guys are way ahead of me. So I'll just skip to my, to my picture of how this works. Uh, instead of using a traditional file system like today, if you have a persistent memory aware file system, the definition of persistent memory aware file system is that when you open up that file using all the APIs everybody's used to, open, close, read, write, mmap, you mmap that file, what you get is this direct load store access, this far right thing here. It goes through, I kind of show it going through kernel space, but actually there's no kernel code, there's no code at all, right? You're doing loads and stores directly to the persistent memory, and this um, eliminates that red software stack that we talked about because it's not, it's not necessary, as Tron pointed out. And it, it's, it is a familiar interface. If you use mmap and you call msync whenever you want to make sure something's durable, it will work. And we have a prototype PMFS, we call it, sitting out on GitHub that uh, you're all welcome to go look at. It's prototype quality, just want to warn you. It was done quickly by some labs guys in Intel Labs. But we're, we're working now on making it into something that is uh, uh, better quality and upstreamable. And that's just the, but I just want to point out, that's a persistent memory aware file system. It's not going to be the persistent memory aware file system, right? Uh, Rick likes to say, competition in this space is good, and I totally agree. I, I want to encourage all file system developers to start thinking about what does it mean to make your particular, your favorite file system persistent memory aware. Yes, sir. So, so didn't you, in the previous few minutes, didn't you make it more complicated? That, I mean, you said there's going to be RAID in here, so I, you're going to, God forbid, do some parody foo or rebuilds yeah. or... So, so like, that's going to mess uh, up your... I'll cool get to that picture. in a minute. Let's, let's, let me push that off for just a moment because I do have pictures of that. But uh, first, let's just talk about the ability for an app to get to persistent memory because I see other questions. Yeah, I, go I just want to make a, a comment here that uh, persistent memory is not a new technology. Um, Core memory was persistent. In college, I had a roommate. I do have a slide with a big giant picture of core. In college, so at the, in college at, I, had a, I had a at roommate. At SDC earlier this week, I, I put up that yeah. slide yeah. and I said, and this is persistent memory and it's ceramic cores that are magnetic and I just started describing it. And the audience, I saw the people taking pictures with their cell phones and things and I thought, I better let them know that I'm right. joking. So, you know, my, so my roommate was working on a project on one of the physics department mini computers and there was a power failure. It is on. Yeah. There you go, put it closer to you. He was working on one of the physics department mini computers on a project. There was a power failure, everything died. He waited 45 minutes, the power came on, his program just kept right on running. Yeah. Is there any thought of replacing all the dims in a computer with persistent memory? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, so, you know, back with core memory, they didn't call it persistent memory, they just called it memory, right? And it was, it was not only was it persistent, it was more persistent than NAND is today. So a lot, a lot of you may not realize, uh, I, but you will if you try and get to some of your data after having it sit on the shelf for a while, but NAND will eventually lose your data if it just sits on a shelf. The core stuff holds data a long time. And uh, I heard a story, I'm not sure if this is apocryphal or not, but when the Challenger exploded, the shuttle, that they had used some core memory in that and they were able to recover some of that and actually still look at some of the program state in that memory. So. Now it, now it is true. At least it, it would be cool if it were true. So uh, anyway, oh wait, I haven't answered this question. So, so absolutely, is there a time when we're, we're thinking of total system persistence? Absolutely. That's not what I'm talking about here though. I'm talking about systems where the persistence is not transparent to the applications. It is a different tier. It's a tier of something between memory and storage. So I w I'm looking for a way for an application that wants to be uh, aware of that tier to be able to use it. So I, I'm definitely looking for a way for an application to be modified and choose to store some things on storage, 
put some things in memory, volatile memory, and some things in persistent memory. Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, from a programming perspective, uh, can you assume that the persistent memory is cache coherent with the CPUs? Um, yes. Um, is persistent memory cache coherent in the CPUs? I have not seen any proposals for a non-cache coherent type of persistent memory. And I, it would, it's hard for me to imagine it even being proposed now that uh, MMUs are integrated into the, I mean, sorry, caches are integrated into the um, processors, that it would actually be a lot more work. They'd have to make changes to the processor cores to make something not cache coherent. But there's a really important point here. So uh, again, uh, uh, coherency and durability, two different things. So I, I map some of this persistent memory and I store a byte to it and the power fails and it comes back and that data is not there. What gives, right? Because when, it, when I do that store, it's globally visible. All the other processors, all the other threads will see it. But it's just sitting in the processor cache. That's still volatile, right? And, and if you think that's weird, again, go back to the last 30 years of MMAP. For 30 years, you can MMAP a file and the first time you do a store, is that durable? Not until you call msync. Yeah. Right? So Same thing is true here. So you're really back to you still need f sync. Or, you, or you still need the sync operation. I mean, it might be durable before that, but it's definitely not guaranteed durable. Now, this guy's been waiting for a while. Go ahead. Yeah, so a, a number of comments. Um, there's the assumption that it's Nirvana somehow to have this load store interface, but of course, the API is not load store, it's read write. Um, and that implies. No, an MMAP API is there for loads and stores. No, no, MMAP, sure, but how many people use MMAP instead of read writes? It's about to be a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's used by every running program today, they just don't know it. Right, but. Shared libraries use it, right? Okay, so one, one could tweak that, but, so, but there are OS level uh, desires for what the hardware should do. And for instance, the hardware really should include DMA capabilities for block transfer. Ah. Um, the hardware should include some protection facilities so that random people don't scribble on the memory, like the BIOS when you're ah. booting. The hardware probably needs IOMMU type capabilities, because if you have a terabyte of, of flash out there, you may not have enough system page maps to even talk to the whole thing. So you end up with weird apertures, <laughs> IOMMUs on both sides of the interface, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And there are cases where you, you don't have coherence um, if it's a PCI device in a multi-master fabric, you could still MMAP the thing, but it's no longer coherent. Yeah. So, you know, everything you can imagine that could go wrong can certainly still go wrong. <laughs> of course, I agree with all that. And, and, I, and I guess I, I'm just saying I'm optimizing for the 90% case. I'm optimizing for non-volatile DIMMs that are cache coherent, that are, do appear in the physical address space of the machine without any apertures and that are DMAable and byte, address, byte addressable. Yeah, and I think that's all a very near-term uh, thing. It's, it's, yep. it's going to change a lot before it settles down. Okay. Uh, last comment is anyone can play with non-volatile memory today. You just get a UPS, and when the UPS tells you the power's going out, you save your memory away to disk. Right. You know, it's, it's been there forever, right. um, and, and big-ass database systems have done this all through the years. Um, you know, it's very specialized things, but you know, in, anyone can do this today. So the question is, why haven't they? Well, so it's it's uh, my answer to that is it's not quite as easy as it sounds. Uh, you know, so you get a UPS. How does that flush your processor caches on a power failure? You get an interrupt. See, you just talked about more than a UPS, right? Now you're talking about a platform that can notify you that the power is going to go away. Now that feature on Intel's platforms is called ADR. And it's just not on every platform, right? So you do have to get a particular platform. Ah. Uh, yeah, but I, I think let's, let's not get into UPS stuff. Okay. I mean, that's stuff we do understand. But byte Fair addressable point. percent memory has some, some more, I think, unique challenges in that, honestly. So. Yeah, we can talk more about that, though, yeah. afterwards. Yeah, go ahead. So there is a hidden assumption here, which you know, we'll have to see how it plays out with hardware that the non-volatile memory will be fast enough that it's worthwhile to basically do a direct load store interface with it. Um, although I heard very carefully, well, it might be a little bit slower, so you might have to wait. It's just you don't want to take an interrupt. 
Um, but that implies that there will be certain programming models where if you're going to be doing lots of heavy <laughs> intensive I.O., maybe you have linked lists, it's in a heap with, you know, data structures, yeah. where it might make sense to have, you know, a level four cache, which is your page cache, um, as opposed to always going directly against the NDM. And it may very well be, depending on how you do your raid, that you kind of have to do that anyway. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that was one observation, is, is that yeah. if we make too many simplifying assumptions, do we end up painting ourselves in the corner? Uh, the other observation I would make is, if you're going to be doing something where people really will be doing heaps with pointers, uh, now we have to start worrying about VM address space. Uh, and Multix had a particularly interesting solution to that, which of course was segmented addressing, um, which most people we still are have that in Intel. probably not familiar with, yeah. except for those of us who have looked at you know the x86 architecture but you know C programs would probably blow up if we started trying to go down that path have you ever had to declare a char far star then you know what he's talking about and, and I want to point point out to 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 anyone that doesn't know it didn't work in multics either <laughs> oh it worked fine I programmed it, it, on PL1 and you know sure null was segment minus two comma so, zero so know. so let me let me make a couple of comments these are these are really great so um, I put on GitHub a little while ago a set of persistent memory examples because I was trying to get people to start thinking about this and programming to it. So in addition to the PMFS, it's uh, github.com slash pmem. And there's some examples there. The first thing I did was I did a malloc that is resilient to failures, right? So it's got an, uh, the little malloc arena um, recovers no matter where you fail. And I, and I have a little fault injection test framework I put there that simulates an interrupt, uh, sorry, simulates a system crash between every possible two instructions and you run it over and over and over again and it and simulates it. And then uh, I, I did the, you know, there's kind of a common Hadoop benchmark that people use where you, you load up a bunch of um, words out of, out of uh, books off of Gutenberg and do a frequency count. And so I thought well, that'd be a good test for me. So I, I loaded up, you know, like 20 million words and I timed it and then uh, you know, of course, all of my data structures use relative pointers. This is to your point. And then I, I uh, rebuilt my code to use map fixed so that it could use absolute pointers. And with just GCC with no arguments, it was about a 1 or 2% difference in performance. It, when I added dash O, it was not measurable. So at least for the relative versus absolute pointer thing, it's just, that's just one of the things the cores do really fast. They, they're really good at adding relative pointers in. So that part, I'm not worried about performance. The other part of performance, of course, is, is the part that I kind of alluded to already. It's the cache flushing, right? So, so you're this program up here, this application. You want to store some of your stuff in RAM. You want to store some of your stuff in this new tier because it's faster than storage and it's persistent and it's byte addressable, right? And you can DMA to it and things like that. Um, but every time that you make a change to a data structure, you, the programmer, have to remember the address of that data structure, like all the cache lines, and go through doing the CL flush instruction for every cache line, or you can call msync, which we, we implemented in this file system to just do what I just said, right? And, and it's, so it's, it is a burden on the programmer. Uh, it's, you know, the performance is obviously a lot faster than storage, but it is a burden on the programmer to remember to, to do msync. So if, if you just, you know, use Google and go find programs out there that use mmap and msync today, I guarantee you it'll take you five minutes to find one that doesn't use msync correctly, right? It's just not very well understood, and that's, that's why I, I put out, like, these fault injection testing tools and things like that, because that's the kind of thing that we're going to need to You to really don't want to put about. a heap in this thing anyway, and the reason is it's not persistent persistent, right? It's you have to use it as a log-based thing, because it will lose its memory, anything that is pending. if power goes that hasn't been because flushed. it's in the caches it's so I mean yeah. you do not want to use this as regular RAM and it has nothing to do with performance it has to do with you want your data structures in regular RAM to be normal data structures and then the persistent memory you need that to be a log based thing or something like that you don't have to go through through the right I mean you can map it even. directly and then access it without copying it to regular RAM but I mean, no, realistically, no, but, but like you if, you have, if you have a complicated usage scenario, which is more than just copy a large amount of memory, you're going to have 
in direction and pointer and management of yes. all the small details you have, you right, do but, not want to have a heap in this thing. So well, so uh, that's, but, right, but that's what my persistent yeah, you, memory you, you, malloc does. It, yeah. The persistent memory malloc I, I put as an example out there, I, I use micro-logging, right? In other words, I didn't use a big journal, but every, you know, in malloc you usually keep a little bit of metadata with everything that gets allocated, and I kept just enough, it was just a cache line's worth that I needed, I kept just enough metadata that after uh, a crash, if something hadn't been linked into whatever it was allocated for, it goes back on the free list. If something was in the middle of being linked in, it finished linking it in. And, and it's, it's exactly what you're saying, right? I created journaling, but, but little bits of but, journaling here and there. But, it's but, exactly what you're saying. But it's, it's worthwhile looking at one of the properties separately, which is the fact that it's byte addressable. Yeah. Okay. Even if it was very, very slow memory, being byte addressable means you could, could for, the, for log-based applications, yeah. write very tiny things to the log, which is a huge performance win over having to write a 4K chunk to the log. Yeah. Right. Um, and so it, it might be worth separating that out as a separate property to exploit. I even, I, I wrote down a list of the things that, that I, the reason why I want to use persistent memory. Byte addressability is one of them. The, just, this, just to your point, because I, I just wanted to add to that really quickly, is the uh, ability to DMA and RDMA to it. Right, this is really kind of a cool thing. You can, you know, it's direct attached storage. You, it's a single point of failure, so you might want to put something in it, but you also might want to put something in another node on the cluster. Persistent memory is the first opportunity we've had in a long time to RDMA to something persistent without having to do any copying after the RDMA is finished. Okay, go so, ahead. so just one comment uh, to what Linus mentioned. Uh, there's a researcher, and I'm unfortunately blanking on his name at HP Labs, that was some, doing some research in persistent heap, mm -hmm. specifically uh, looking at NVRAM, uh, and the model he used was basically an atomic M-Sync. Yeah, that's where Hans, nothing, yeah. nothing would actually hit the persistent storage until you called M-Sync, and it was an all or nothing that's thing. Yeah, I know, and, it's and different from this, uh, right? And the question is, what's the right programming model? So, right? so I the have- The interesting thing, I just wanted one quick yeah, thing, which yeah. is, he did, uh, his graduate student, yeah. did a prototype uh, hacking EXD3 to have failure atomic M-Sync, right? So right. no magic NVRAM. Benchmarked it against a traditional database. Now, granted, it was a crappy traditional database, SQLite, but it was actually faster to use an atomic M-Sync with a programming model where you just simply messed with the heap, called M-Sync, and that was an atomic transaction. Now, it may very well be that we would want to do something different, but that would be another example where you might use the page cache as an L4 uh, cache, and then you would have some kind of persistent yeah. commit operation that would then flash you to persistent ten, memory. I mean, if you remember, even back at Collapse Summit, uh, Nisha talked about Fusion.io right. using today's Fusion.io cards as like an L4 Right. kind of back in cash, right? So you, yeah. I mean, I'm sure there'll be different ways to configure it. Yeah, so, yeah. so my, my point is we okay. should be a little bit creative about what the programming models might look like. And so the fact that there's this guy who was, and I'm, I forget his name, but you know, he was yeah. doing thinking along those so, lines. So he sent me his paper and I read it. And I, I gotta tell you, you know, I, first of all, I liked the paper, it was really interesting stuff, right? I'm against changing the core semantics of MSync because MSync has not been transactional for so many years. It's, there's nothing that, that says when you call msync that the data isn't already durable or that some of it isn't already durable. Call it I think else. it needs to stay that way. But yes, maybe something new, right? Like, again, I, I built a transactional malloc just on top of it. I just, I don't like changing are, the existing msync. And Andy, there are, like in SCSI and everything, there's atomic updates, atomic writes that right. are vectored being proposed. So there are new storage APIs that we could enforce selectively. So I, for, I, I for the I mean, storage stack, it's easy, right? Yeah. If, if you want to change the way read or write does something or something up and down the storage stack, that's great because you have a control point. You have kernel code that you run. For load store accessible, you can't and just say, oh, I want Atomics to be bigger because, you know, the, you can only be Atomic with what one instruction can do without imposing some additional structure on it like a journal so or a log. I, I'm still... So transactional memory doesn't really solve this problem. It doesn't really comprehend persistence. Um, and remember, transactional memory is, is best effort. You still have to code. It's really about lock elision, right? It's, you still have to code what happens if, you, if the transaction do, doesn't happen, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to just a, a, yeah. a little higher level point as well, is that we actually do have a need, I think, because I mean, people mentioned how hard it is to change application semantics or syscall or API. We still have to tune our existing stack to run on a persistent memory-like block device, right? Oh, that's, absolutely. That's like just the starting stuff. 
And I kind of skipped over that earlier question, but obviously one of the use cases here is just to expose the stuff as a block device, then you can, you can raid across it as long as you're cognizant of how interleaving is going between these dims, right? Don't, don't raid across two dims that are interleaved together and expect RAID to be able to recover your data, right? If so give, If we can give Ted an EXT4 only 10 million IOs per second instead of 15 million IOs per second, you'll still have EXT4 per, per performance tuning to, to tackle. And, and the block driver, the block driver that we've put together for this is completely synchronous, right? The, there's no, a, a DIM cannot be a DMA master, right? So there's no DMA for the transfer. The core does the transfer. It does a mem copy, basically. And that means, you know, there's, you, they go down to the block stack with, a, with an IO operation, and it's done when you return, right? It's, it happens synchronously. Um, so anybody who... But, but you might still need to msync that, that range that you copied out, right? It's still might be no, no, so msync is really just for the memory mapped case. Right. If you're going down the, the storage stack, yeah. it, it's, we sync it for you. You sync it. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, we didn't write our driver that way. So this is another really good point. Um, I, I kind of wanted to talk about the persistent memory thing here, but let me go into this point because it's important enough, I think, that if you're building a block device, on top of persistent memory, it's very tempting just to make it a simple M copy, a mem copy, right, and just copy it in. But there's a lot of code out there that makes the, by the way, incorrect assumption that you don't get torn sectors on a power failure, right? It, it actually, it, it, it thinks that like a SCSI I.O. is not terrible by a power failure. Uh, and so we, in the driver we're doing, we put power fail right atomicity in. And obviously, we do it the obvious way, right? We, we, every write's an allocating write, and there's a little indirection table. And so uh, on a power failure, if you're in the middle of a sector write, when, when you come back, whatever that block size is will be either the old data or the new data, but not half and half. But, but with load stores, there's no sector notion anyway, so. No, I'm talking about a, driver, a block driver that we made. So we, right. we, we are gasketing it into the block framework. So, yeah. so well, just, one just thing that clarity, would be nice is. To is make this really clear. There's, there's a block driver of, that the Intel research people put out there and a persistent memory file right. system. Both. There's, okay. there's one of each of these things. There's a, this and this. Yeah. Well, one, one thing that'd be nice, again, for a byte addressable storage is if you're doing uh, synchronous writes from the user level to be able to get small writes all the way through the stack without doing a read modify write to a, to a larger block size. So, so if, if you're using a block driver and to, to make something appear like a block device, I can make the block size anything you want. If you want to do something less than the, the, the block size supported by the block stack, I suggest just map, M mapping it and then doing, now you're down to byte reads and writes. Yeah, right. I, I don't think yeah, you want to have the, the normal Linux IO stack do like a seven byte block write, right? I mean, we, we had enough trouble. It'd be a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> but an awful lot of that happens today where people are doing, you know, like a 64-byte write, and, you know, down yeah. at the bottom, it, it becomes a 4K write, you know, going to flash, which then yeah. further... But that 64-byte write is just a perfect fit for the persistent memory API, for, for just mem memory mapping it. And right, right, but, but you're not going to change your app to only support, you know, you're, you're not going to change your app, period, really. Well, I, I, I'd so, push back on that. I think, yeah. again, I, I think really fundamentally, you're, we have to think of it in two stages, right? Legacy apps, and that's like 99% of the applications in the world, won't change. So we have to be really focused on tuning the I.O. stack to be blazing fast at 5, 10, 15 million I.O.s per second. There's a lot of work to be done there. And you won't do partial updates. You're not going to do like 7-byte or 64-byte writes through that atomically. That's that's the price you pay. You do read, modify, write, but you're doing millions of, tens of millions of IOs per second. You know, not so bad. If you want to get to the full power of byte addressability, you're going to have to change the apps. And again, it'll be a small fraction of the apps in the world to do that, but you can right. attack this by doing libraries, by doing commonly used things like, my, you know, MySQL or... Yeah, and I think of it as two maybe. levels. There's change the app to use persistent memory, or there's change some middleware or some kernel component to use persistent memory so that everybody benefits, but the app doesn't see any sort of change. And I think both of those are going to happen. But, yeah, but, but I think it, it's still worthwhile looking at a, a byte addressable storage feature for the SCSI stack where you never have to read a block unless it's, you know, if you're only doing writes, mm -hmm. why not just ship the, a small write right on down to the device if it supports byte addressable? But, so, 
No, not the application. The applications are already doing, you know, log-based things of, of sync a little bit here, a little bit there. So okay. Well, we can talk more about that. So, so yeah, isn't okay. isn't ultimately what we have to do to the data structures, right? So whether it's in the app or in the file system, and that you have to look at the data structures that that the user, the application is trying to, what are they trying to accomplish? And what's yeah. the difference if it's now persistent when it used to just go away? Right? So, and so, so whether it's at yeah. the application level, the file system layer, you have to reason about in this new world, what does it mean for this developer data structure, or user data structure? And, right? and so I've been thinking of this as sort of a series of steps. The first thing is just to get persistent memory up to the application. And that's why I want to use the memory mapped file thing that, that has a permission model and, and everybody's more or less knows how to use it. Then I want to build on top of that, you know, there, there, I think initially there are going to be libraries and things that, that do things like transactions and journaling and so on. Long term I think we're going to see language extensions that, you know, so for example there'll be some decorator that you put on an object in Java that says this is in persistent memory and then the app just uses it and, and the JVM knows when it has to use these underlying system calls and things to, to make it work. Yeah, and so then I guess my way of reasoning through that is so what you're doing in that first instance where you're just saying, well, this is, this is MMAP, but it's, it's faster than it used to be. And, and so you're asking the developer to make a, a, a change in the way they're thinking about how their data is stored. Absolutely. And, and, and you're constraining the way that they're doing that because you're saying, well, you know, go ahead, use this MMAP thing, but it's persistent. Well, there are really only a couple of ways of getting something into the address space of a process. So if it's not MMAP, why would I invent something else, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use what I think is a common way to give somebody load store access to something. I mean, I think people are missing the other point about persistent storage is you're going to have multiple users, which right. means locking. And it's across threads, but it's very much across different processes too. So you can't even use traditional spin locks or mutexes or something like that because you're going to have Regardless of what you're doing, like if I put Git in this, I will have multiple Git processes touching the same persistence story. Right. If I do a database, I will have the database process, but I will also have the reporting stuff. This is all stuff that means it's never, I mean, this whole discussion has been largely about how to treat this as memory and then just read and write to it directly. But you, it's, yeah. It's a new I'm thing. coming back to the point that you can't treat it as memory because you are going to do different things with persistence, yeah. except in some really simple special it, cases. It's not memory, it's not so, storage. Yeah. It's a new thing. Yay! It's going to be really cool, right? But it, we do have to get people into that mindset of it's a new tier. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, the, the comment is you have to carefully define what is atomic, what, what are the primitives, what can you depend on, I completely agree. I completely agree. Yeah. So what about uh, a model that it would be read-only for certain files, areas, you know, maybe the kernel won't get a TLB miss now if you can just execute out of it but never change it? Um, well, I mean, if, if, you just, if you just map it the way I'm showing here with pro read, for example, I think, I think you get what you're talking about already. The, the mappings will be shared. Right. The, everybody, you know, by the way, map, I am talking about doing map shared here, right? Exactly, okay. For, okay. for exactly the reason why this, is, this needs to go. It's kind of like, think of this as like when you map a frame buffer or a graphics memory or something, right? You're using mmap to get this device mapping, really. Um, what it, it, does, it is worth mentioning, what happens if you do map private? And what, what we decided should happen is you do get the direct mapping here, but if you try and write to it, then it gets copy on write into DRAM, not into NVM, because people are used to map private things going away, just getting thrown away when the program exits, and I kind of preserved that semantic. It was just my best guess on what, on what should happen there, yeah. When you talk about flushing from the CPU's cache into persistent memory, Please don't. Talk about write back. Assume that you have a CPU that can tell the difference and can do the right thing. Yeah, so uh, when, when you do a store to this memory mapped persistent memory, uh, you actually have a couple of choices, right? If you just do with no other special arguments or anything, you just map it and then you do a store to it, of course it goes into the processor cache. 
and it just sits there until some cache pressure sends it out or until you do a seal flush or the msync system call, we make that work. Um, you can also do a non-temporal store, right? So that's a, that's a store in Intel, in the Intel architecture that goes around the cache. And then you don't have to do the cache flush. Or, as you're saying, you can memory map it, you know, you could arrange for it to be mapped as, as write through or something, but you don't want to do that. But what, what instruction is that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, that, that's a very fair comment. You'll see in the, in the example code that I put out there, I don't make any assumptions. In fact, I, I probably let it leak through a little too much, my yearning for that instruction. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I, have, I do have a desire for that instruction, but we don't have that instruction. And so I, I've been buying, you know, beers for the chip guys, and... And I don't think I've gotten them quite drunk enough yet, but I think I, I will eventually. So, yeah. Ah, uh, so um, this is uh, kind of back to the earlier point I was making about ADR. So just flushing something out of the cache isn't even enough, right? And and this is another back to the earlier point about something not being durable. Um, you know, unless you really do something to make sure it's durable. If you just get it out of the cache, it could still be sitting in some intermediate buffer. Uh, for example, many embedded memory controllers have some staging buffer. If you wait long enough, it will go out. But how long do you wait, right? So that's kind of a pain in the butt. Um, there's, a, there's a feature on the platforms called ADR that on a power failure will we'll flush those things. And for now, my examples assume that that feature exists. And Another one as a nice to have if you're talking to the chip guys yeah. would be an ability to write a whole cache line. Yes. Then there is no read, modify, write. I, I would say device. it another way, the ability to atomically write a whole cache line. Because right? you can write a whole cache line now with some, one of those instructions like move NTDQ, but it's apparently not atomic with respect to the DIM. So yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. So, yeah, you got it. Oh, you have so, one. Yeah. So. You've been talking a lot about, about NVM as storage. Um, it's already the case that, you know, on a price per gigabyte, um, you know, SSDs are already much, much, you know, an order of magnitude cheaper than DRAM. What about the model of NVM as just cheap DRAM? Yeah, uh, this is a great question. Why is, why, what about making your DRAM bigger, just not because you need persistence, but because NVM turns out to be cheaper? I, I think that's going to happen. Um, you know, I think if you just kind of Google around and look at what, what these companies are promising, I think that's exactly what's going to happen. And I think, um, uh, I think one of the funnest projects that one of us should, should embark on is, is changing the, the page cache in Linux to have two tiers. One, you know, because assuming they're not the same performance, you're going to want a tier between them. But have a, have a, a volatile tier and, a, and, and this other tier. Maybe it's persistent, maybe not. Maybe it wakes up warm and it's a warm cache, or maybe you just say, oh, that's too hard, but I at least want to have this other tier of, of slightly slower memory. Uh, I, I'm, I think that's going to be a great project. Let's do it. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, one thing that a lot of people are talking about, sort of like the fun things you can do with non, with non volatile memory, like with the Java decorators that you mentioned and stuff. But one, mention, one thing that we have to think about is. <clears throat> Uh, addressability and like manageability. So if you've got these Java decorators, Java's going and persisting this stuff out for you, you're the sysadmin and you want to flush that, how do you address it? You need to find it, you need to figure out you know, where Java put that stuff so you can remove it in the case where you like to get rid of something. Yeah. And for backups, you need to be able to address it so you know exactly what you need to back up. Right. So that's, that's why I name it like a file. Right, and, and our persistent memory aware file system isn't just about making an mmap that bypasses the page cache, but of course the normal POSIX operations work so that you can tar it off. Backup tools work, right, and, and, and RM works and MV works and things like that, and it's really just for that purpose, right? I don't care much about the performance of those things because the whole point of this is to get the, the persistence up into the application space and let it do its thing with 
with direct access. But, but I still think you need to be able to manage it like, like files, like you're used to. I don't think that was that me. I was going to say, we, yeah. we have 10 minutes roughly, Andy. So okay. I, I think maybe it's good to talk about, just to reiterate, what people have been doing, you know, actively doing, what's kind of pending. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, we did this prototype PMFS. It's out there. It's not very good quality yet, but we're working on that. Um, and it's, it is literally just, just there to keep pages out of the page cache, right? It's, it's really to give you this direct access. Um, I'm hoping to encourage other file system developers to, make, to, to think about what it means to make your file system persistent memory aware. And there's two ways to do that. Right? One is to make your file system just leverage persistent memory to do what it does better. Right? So you might say, oh, I want to store some of my metadata there, or I might want to have a cache in it or something like that, but the app doesn't really know anything changed. And then the second is to do what we're doing here, is actually expose the persistent memory to the app. So for example, what if ButterFS had a, an extended attribute on a file that said, oh, I want to be able to do, use this as persistent memory, and then it, it didn't use the page cache for that particular file. or something. I'm not quite sure how it should work. So, yeah. I mean, you could even get, uh, do the mic. Yeah. I said you were going to come back and talk about RAID. Oh, RAID. Yeah, so, so with the, the RAID thing, again, so for persistent memory, it's a really long discussion, right? Um, I have it in a backup slide. The C clamp. The C clamp, right? So people are used to adding things around the file system, usually below the file system, to do things like RAID. And but with persistent memory, you're doing this direct access, you don't have the control point. So the question becomes, do we want to have transparently replicated persistent memory? And if so, how does that work? Right? And I have a couple of answers to this, but I mostly just wanted to plant the seed and say, well, think about how that should work. Um, one, the, about the only thing I'm against is making it work with the existing interposing drivers, because I don't want, if you think about how that would have to work, you're basically reinventing the block stack. We're going to have block mode, and it's going to be really fast, and everybody's going to love it. So let's not reinvent the block stack over here. Let's make this about having something new, a direct mode. All right? but, but I still think people are going to want to do things like replication here. And, and really, there are only a couple of answers. Right? Either it happens up here in a user space library, or maybe we catch, you know, modify. We, we track, you know, the, there's this feature in the Intel chipset for tracking modified pages that's used by virtualization. Maybe we do something like that and have some magic, sort of eventually consistent magic model. Magic hardware replication. Magic hardware stuff, yeah. So that's the best answer I have right now. So for now, I'm, I'm kind of pushing that off. I'm saying if you need those things like RAID and so on, the same technology is going to be available through the block stack. It's going to be fast, and that stuff's been optimized well, for the years. Other, the other thing I'll throw yeah. out, Andy, is I mean, so if you look kind of at, and we haven't mentioned cloud yet this whole hour, so, but if you look at cloud data protection schemes, yeah. it's very common to RAID or shard files at a file level. So you can actually do that, absolutely do that up in user space and do it yeah. actually quite well, right? And get resilience between servers, not just between storage. This is a server. great fit for the cloud because yeah. they really, they don't care about the single point of failure of direct attached storage because they replicate at a higher level. That's right. And, uh, and I, I've definitely come up with some cloud usages, like some Hadoop usages, where they're currently just need to like they just need to go do a, a key lookup or something, but they're forced to read in blocks from a from a file system because that's all they have today. So it may be a very good fit for persistent memory. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go back to kind of what people have been talking about and what people have been working on. So the Intel research people have two projects kind of joined at the hip: the persistent memory file system, persistent memory block device. Right. There are pointers to those. Those are both open source. People should look at them, poke at them, kick at them, make fun of them. Um, other people um, have been looking at other ways to write either very lightweight, custom tailored persistent memory file systems. Looking at, to, to your point earlier, you know, if you wanted to modify ext4 TED, you know, you could do maybe, you know, bitmap allocations at less than a block granularity, right? The file system down in its bowels could do things to take advantage of persistent memory that aren't application exposed, or expose this at an application layer through mmap. There's a whole SNEA non-volatile memory working group, which is looking at kind of architectural programming models for this. Right. So there's a industry forum that's debating. Jeff Moyer is our Red Hat person. Andy's there. A bunch of the existing uh, Flash people are there as well, looking at how this goes. So it's, I think it's actually fairly exciting technology. This is, yeah. and outside of storage, again, you have the whole, you know, if you have nothing but this in a box, 
you know, powering off and powering back on again, you go back to the core example someone used before, you turn it back on and it's still running the same apps. It's not always a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just have, maybe I missed the first five minutes. Uh, what are the crash behaviors? I mean, um, I have two issues that I get worried about when with persistent memory. One is wild pointers uh, and just the kernel crashes and takes everything down with it. When stuff is on disk, that seldom corrupts the disk. Right. When stuff is in persistent memory, it has the potential to really wipe out everything, right? Yeah. Uh, the other issue is just as atomicity at any level, is there any guarantee of, I mean, power goes out. Cache line was in the middle of a CL flush and you made sure to use like a signature or something that you know, this right. is the cache line that guarantees that everything else is valid. But then it's striped over four different dims and it turns every other byte in that cache line got written out and every other did not, or something. I don't know how it works. Are there any real hard atomicity guarantees at that level? So uh, uh, my best answer at this point, in, in, you know, c given that companies haven't announced a lot of the details yet of these technologies, my best answer is that yes, there will be things that can be depended on. And I'm, I'm working, the, the whole reason I got all, all those people together in that work group is to make sure we have a way to expose it so that people can, so a program can ask, what is atomic? What can I depend on? And a library probably will ask that question, right? So I, the answer is yes, we will have uh, things that you can depend on, but I can't guarantee every product will have them be the same thing, so I want to make them discoverable. Yeah. Yeah, we we've been really careful in that NVM group like we don't define the APIs because we think, you know, like you guys, the Linux community, you own the Linux API. You're not going to want some standards body to do an invention by committee and then say, "Oh, here's your API by the way. When can we have it?" you know. So we don't define the APIs. What we're instead trying to do is define the common things you're talking about. What's what are the needs, the common uh, language around it? What are the common programming models? And then I already you know, have a proposed API for Linux that I put on my little GitHub site. You guys can all look at, but it's, it looks like the man page of MMAP, right? And with just a, with just a, a little bit of extra stuff that, that tells you how you can do cache flushing from user space if you don't want to call msync. So uh, it does, does give you things you can build on, even, even even on the platforms I'm emulating on today, it gives you some atomics you can build on. Yeah. To the first question, is there some way to protect the pages from when in the kernel we probably map a large amount of it because we yes. need to for performance, but at the same time we don't want to crash and just scribble over everything by so, mistake. So in my picture here, it's the app that wants the huge mapping, right? And so. Honestly, we have, we have no reason to map this stuff in kernel space, except for a little bit here and there, like some metadata for this file system, but that's like less than 1% of the file system, right? And, and for the block device, we, we uh, have techniques for just mapping little bits of it at a time, just for this reason, right? We don't want to, otherwise you, you greatly increase the odds that a stray pointer is going to actually do silent data corruption. And so I'm, I'm all over that. That's a, it's a serious uh, problem that, uh, you know, the, the SMAP feature that is recently added to the Intel chip is, is what allows these applications to map huge amounts of it, but without the kernel able to scribble on it. So. Yeah. I'll be here. I'll be, you know, buy me a drink at the thing tonight and I'll tell you anything you want to know, but I'll deny it later. Yeah, so we actually have, I think, a tea and coffee break right now. I think James called it a tea break if James hasn't escaped. Um, but after that, we're going to come back. Uh, we're going to be talking about, Anna's going to talk about where we are with copy offload with Zach and Trond and other people. Um, and at the end of the hour, we're going to talk about thinly provisioned storage with device mapper and XFS tunings. And then we have another session this afternoon where we're going to talk about the actual opposite end of this universe, which is SMR drives. So if you have really <laughs> dense tracks and very few IOPS, 
How do you get these multi-terabyte monsters to behave under file systems and what the drive vendors are proposing for us? So Definitely not byte addressable. They're not byte addressable, yeah. <laughs> Multi-megabyte addressable. Okay, and another note, there is an etherpad. I see no one decided to, to record for posterity's sake what we've said, but if you hover over the schedule, you can put your notes, your thoughts, your impressions, your questions out there, and we'll try to wrap it up at the end of the day and summarize. So thank you.